known anyone who's travelled with me in the last in, the, in recent years will know that I have a lot of trouble staying away from Nehemiah, the shortest man in the Bible, Nehemiah. <laughs> it's all right; you'll get it later. A lot of people have a try. Will know that that there's somewhere along the track I have to talk about Nehemiah. God. Well, Nehemiah has been one of those people, obviously, all my growing up, you hear about Nehemiah. In fact, uh, Janine and I had the privilege, Janine, Jared and I, the three of us, had the privilege of being in Papua New Guinea in the, again in the 90s and, uh, and building a Bible college campus up there. And, of course, you can't help, when you're building a campus, you can't help but come around Nehemiah in devotion time and stuff like that. But, you know, the, Nehemiah has opened up to me in a totally different way in, in recent years. And... Uh, I just can't help but go back there again and trust I'm hearing from God. And Nehemiah has really challenged me. You know, as we talk about the apostolic and being apostolic, you know, I have to be honest with you that I am in one sense over us talking about the apostolic. It's time to be apostolic. You know, I'm sick in one sense. and I'm not, It might have been a season and all that stuff. Sorry, sound man. Wandering too far. You have to excuse me. I am a wanderer. <laughs> I'm past trying to justify that we need the fivefold gifts in the life of the body of the Christ. I don't remember a time in my life when I've had to justify and trying to prove to someone that dad is needed in my family. I've never once tried to have to try and defend and prove that Janine is needed as part of my family. So if we can just be all in agreement that we need the fivefold, we need the gifts that Jesus gave us. Yes, can, any offence there? Okay, so let's just go on from there. <laughs> let's just go on. We need, we need the fivefold working in this family. So now it's time for us to be apostolic. It's time for us to go forward. It's time for us to function in the apostolic. And I believe that Nehemiah is, is, is an Old Testament picture there that can help us today. You know, Nehemiah, here he is a man, and you feel free to read it. I, I guess you all know it fairly well. But here's Nehemiah right from the beginning. Nehemiah, here he is in captivity. And his rallies come along, and he says to them, what is going on in my homeland? What is happening back at home? What is the situation? He's a man burdened for what is happening in his homeland. He's a man who has a passion. He's not just idly sitting there. He's not just living it up in his position. Now, I mean, in essence, for being in captivity, for being, quote-unquote, a slave or whatever you want to call it, really he had a pretty cushy job. Now, I do know that if he frowned the wrong way and, or whatever else, he could have had his head pulled off. I do know that you know, if, he, if someone did try to poison the king and he drunk it, well, yes. There, but really, let's just face it, he really did have a pretty good job for a slave. He could have isolated himself from what was around. But here's a man with a passion in his heart. A guy that couldn't let go. What is going on in my homeland? He wanted to know what was happening at home. And this horrible story comes back to him as his rally said, Oh, the walls of Jerusalem are broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Here's this homeland of his, this city, this home city of his in devastation. Here's this city, the walls have all crumbled down. The enemy can come and go however he wishes. The enemy can come in at night, the enemy can come in at day. The enemy can come and go and do whatever he wants to do, bring whatever devastation at any time. And here he is, a long, 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 long way away. But he is grieved at the state of his people. I have to ask you, do the state of your people, if I can put it that way, does it grieve you? Does it hurt you? You know, we've had a heart-wrenching, for the want of a better word, incredible, beautiful testimony this morning of, of parents who cry out because of the state of their family. Where do you stand when it comes to your family? Where do you stand when it comes to your, your church family? Where do you stand when it comes to those further abroad from you? Where do you? Where do you stand when it comes to the state of the nation of Australia? Where do you stand when it comes to 
the state of wherever your homeland may be around the world? Do we grieve for the, the state of the body of Christ, which in our nation is so compromised? Yes. Nehemiah couldn't help but grieve. He wept for so long. I think that really by the time... Oh, here he says, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. That's verse 4 of chapter 1. But you know, there came a time when he stood before the king. Now here, in one sense, I mean, you can, you can play it down, but in one sense he was being an Esther, being an Esther. Because that day when he went before the king, some five or six months later, I believe it is, when he stood before the king and allowed his face to be downcast, he knew that he could have been executed. He knew that was the last thing you did before the king. And as Esther took a life in her own hands to come before the king, this guy was able to go before the king all the time to serve him, but to be downcast in front of the king. But here God uses him and the king gives him great favour and you know the story. But one of the things that really grabbed my heart with Nehemiah in verse 6 is he says... I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my family, what we have committed against you. Now here's a guy that wasn't prepared to just blame everybody else. Here's a guy that wasn't prepared to say, oh well, if this would change, if the government would change, then we would be right in Australia. If the local government would change, if the mayor didn't do this, if the pastor didn't do this, if my mother didn't do this, always finding excuses for the state of our family or the state of our nation or the state of this or the state of that. And yet this man decided to take responsibility. Here he is, how far from his nation, probably one of the most, one of the most, I'm sure there was others that God had their hand upon, but this guy obviously had a great relationship with God that he was passionate in the way he was. He could have said, well, it's not my fault, God. I'm just here as a captive. It's not my fault, God. I'm not back there. If I was back there, maybe I could do something. But look at those ones that are back there. Why aren't they doing something? But no, he chose to make a stand. He chose to repent on behalf of myself, starting with himself to repent before God. I repent. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself, and my family, and he went on to his family, father's family, etc. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. He's a man who had a passion. He's a man who didn't forget. And I think you all know the story as this man, then with the passion in his heart, he went back to Jerusalem. He decided that he was going to do something different. He decided that it was going to be different. So he went back to Jerusalem. He went and looked around, looked at what was going on and rallied the troops. And here an interesting comment is made. As people rallied and people saw the need, come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I want to jump on from there and fast forward right to chapter 3. And chapter 3 to most people is quite a boring chapter in our society. In chapter 3 it starts outlining all of the things, all of the parts of the wall. As the people rallied, it starts outlining who did this and this priest did this and built this and this person built this and this person rebuilt the, the gate at the pool and this one rebuilt the sheep gate and it goes on and on and on and it, like I said, for some people it's a really boring section. But you know, as I read through there, I couldn't help but see some of these verses that jumped out at me. Because here he is, here's this guy, right, in verse 10, for instance. Adjoining this, Jedediah, the son of Wilborough, made repairs, made repairs opposite his house. Opposite his house. And here's another guy that says he made repairs next to him. 
um, verse 23, beyond him Benjamin and Hashab made repairs in front of their house and next to them, I was going to say Azaria, but same thing, Azaria, Azariah, made repairs beside his house. Verse 28, above the, ho- above the horse gate, the priests made repairs, each in front of his own home. Next to him, Zadok, son of Immer, made repairs opposite his house. And I think you get my point. So, you know, in the, when it comes to the apostolic, and you've all heard me say it before, I believe the outworking of the apostolic is each and every one of us in full-time ministry. So if the fivefold were given for equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, if you consider yourself to be a saint this morning, God has called you to full-time ministry. We have killed ourselves with our religious jargon and our religious rubbish, which puts us back into an Old Testament dispensation that says the priest is going to do the work and all I am here is to bring, throw money or whatever it might be. We have destroyed what we can achieve for the kingdom of God by our language and by our religious whatever you want to call it. Because God, Jesus didn't die on the cross for us to sit back and do nothing. He didn't die on the cross and say, now we are all kings and priests under him. He didn't, come and, he didn't go through that and make that sacrifice for us to sit in an Old Testament dispensation and achieve nothing. I keep on saying to people, you know God tore the, t- tore the curtain in two when Jesus died and from that moment onwards, from that moment till today, man has been trying to sew the curtain up. And depending on what fellowship you walk into as to how tightly that curtain is sewn. And don't fool yourself, brothers and sisters. We say we're Pentecostal. We say we've got it all together, but don't fool yourself. We've been trying to tie the curtain up. I'm sorry I'm being a bit straight here this morning, but I am over it. Here we are, supposed to be children of the king, functioning as children of the king, and here we are, tightening the curtain up, isolating ourselves from the Holy of Holies, telling ourselves we're not able, but God has called you this morning. God has called you to be a full-time minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If the fivefold are given for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, you are called to ministry this morning. The way I explain it to my brothers and sisters in, in Papua New Guinea and, and other places where I've had the privilege of sharing, you know, I say to the pastors, I say, you know, because in Papua New Guinea they are just overboard, totally overboard on the state of origin. I mean, I am talking overboard. I'm talking wake up on Thursday morning, the headlines on the newspaper, good night last night, only three died as a result of the state of origin. I'm talking they are overboard worship. All right, it is disgusting. But I say to the pastors, I say, you know, in the state of origin, where does the camera focus? How many times do you see Mel Meninga's face? You know, the only times really are often replays of his whatever he might do, depending on what happened, and he's carry on. But where is the focus? The focus is on those fighting the war. The focus, the whole reason people come, the whole reason people turn their TVs on is not to watch Mel Meninga sitting in some silly box. You know what I'm saying? The reason people come and watch, the whole focus of the cameras is on those fighting the war. You see, that coach, Mel Meninga, and, and other coaches, obviously there's multiple coaches, they had to equip the saints, if I can use that word. They had to equip those who were going to war, equip them for that day. But during those 40 minutes, they could not go near them. They could not touch that ball. They could not intervene. And yes, they got a little half-timer or whatever it might be. And then they were out fighting that battle again. They had to fight that war again. At the risk of being stoned, can I suggest this morning that those five false, five-fold ministries really are coaches. If I can just change the language a bit, just so that we change our heads a bit, if their coaches are given to us, those five-fold coaches are given to us to equip us for full-time ministry, if our mentality tomorrow morning we wake up, Father, I'm going as a full-time minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ into the mission field you've put me in today. 
Can you imagine as a school teacher rising up on Monday morning and saying, God, I'm going to my mission field today. Use me for your glory. The main purpose, the whole purpose. You know, when our mentality changes, when we see that we've been called, we don't go to work to earn money. There was much, much reply there. Right now. <laughs> I thought I'd get some comment out of Les. <laughs> we don't go to work to earn money. It's just a bonus. Because God's my provider. Centrelink ain't my provider. My boss ain't my provider. Someone who chooses to, to give me some, a, a job or a contract, they're not my provider. Because while I'm relying on them, I tell you what, I've got a miserable life because I'm... What's going to happen tomorrow? But you know when you rise up in the morning and say, God, I'm a full-time minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've got a purpose today. I've been called today. It's a different world. And no matter what situation you're in, you can be used by God today. You know, I remember, I don't know how many years ago, you know, it was, I was going through this time when I felt that no one needed me, no one wanted me, and I've been isolated from all that I thought God had called me to be. And if you look on it in the natural, you could, you could get depressed. What's going on, God, you know? I thought you wanted me to do this. No, 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 no. But oh, what a beautiful lesson as God just took me through the processes. And, you know, I remember those days and, and, you know, I should do it every day. And it's too easy to get slack, you know. But I remember those days just waking up in the morning, giving glory to God for how wonderful he is. Praying for those that I thought had, and I thought had deceitfully, despitefully used me. And then just saying, Jesus, make me a blessing to someone today. God, make me a blessing to someone today. And you know, if every one of us would wake up in the morning and say, God, make me a blessing to someone today, we'd change the world. We would change the world. You know, I remember the days I said, God, what's happened today? I don't remember being a blessing to anyone today. And God, remind me of a phone call or remind me of this or remind me of that. I remember one, one Sunday afternoon, we'd, you know, I've been visiting a particular church in the morning and we're, we're driving home Sunday, late Sunday afternoon and we stopped in another town and fellowship with them that night. And, but, you know, it was on the way to that second church, 5.30 in the afternoon. I'm driving along and saying, oh, God, I didn't ask you to make me a blessing to someone today. You know, I got up in the morning and puddled off the church and doing this and doing that, but I didn't make that a specific prayer of my heart. And this is 5.30 in the afternoon. And you know what? After the, that night service where we just dropped in and we're just fellowshiping with... The next thing after this service, one, an acquaintance, someone had had loose connection with in one sense for many, many years. You know, we end up in the car park for, talking for an hour and a half, two hours, and just pouring out the heart, the pain that they're in, and all that sort of stuff. God wants to use you, brothers and sisters. God wants to use you. I'm going to have to keep on moving. <laughs> God wants to use you for his glory. So here we are, Nehemiah, everyone, everyone doing a particular task. Now I'm saying, and I'm using this as a picture of the apostolic, because each person rose up. There was no point in Nehemiah walking into town and saying, okay, I've got to rebuild the wall, and taking on all the responsibilities himself, because he would still be doing it now today. But as a coach, he rallied the troops. He got behind, he served those that, that caught the vision. And each in front of their own home. What can you take from this? Each in front of their own home. Brothers and sisters, I would personally, no, just two and a half months ago, whatever, been over in Nauru with Brother John. We had a great time, didn't we, bro? What a privilege. But you know, I was really, really challenged over there. We, I was asked to do a men's conference over there. It's just uh, not something I usually get asked to do. But I just... For me, I just couldn't get off Nehemiah in the sense of the burden leading up to that. And, and the very first night, I, I spoke on Nehemiah as the foundation for the rest of the, the men's conference. <coughs> Excuse me. But, you know, I focused a lot that weekend. We started talking about families and, and individual units. And I want to say this morning, when it talks about building the wall in front of your own home, it does go down to your individual family unit. You know, we've got a wall to build in Australia. We've got a build, wall to build in, in this nation. We've got a wall to, to rebuild in this, this family here. But you've got a wall to build in your own family. 
You know, it comes right back to you as an individual. Unless you build the walls in you as an individual, then it will affect your marriage. You know, you can stand there and blame your wife for all that's going wrong, or you can do this and you can do that, but you know, when you start to take some responsibility and say, God, forgive me for what I have done, when you start to rise up and start to build this, when you rise up, things start to change. Building the wall in front of your own home. Building the wall, your own family. You know, this nation is only built on strong families. Without strong families, this nation doesn't exist. Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself to think we can build a strong nation. Unless we restore families in this nation, we don't have a nation. What are you doing to rebuild the wall in your own home? What are you doing to rebuild the wall in this family? You know, God has called each and every one of us. I've said it how many times already to full-time ministry. You know what? There's pastors amongst us everywhere. There's coaches here amongst you. There may be two or three or whatever that maybe think I'm a help to them, but you know what? There's a whole lot of people think you're a help to them. Are you going to shirk their responsibility and say, oh, go and see Pastor Paul? Or are you going to rise up for what God has called you to do? Because if there's people that believe in you, you know, the pastor can't reach out to more than a, an isolated few people. A pastor can't love 100 people. Forgive me. I mean, you can love them in the sense of, you know, pray for them and all that sort of stuff, but you cannot. You cannot reach out and have a passion and a burden, a strong passion and a burden that breaks your heart for too many people. But what three has God put in your heart? What four has God put in your heart? Who can you reach out to? Who can you touch this week? Who can you have a burden for? Who can you pray for regularly? Who can you know what, the, who in your life can you know what they're going through and, and when they're going through a hard time, go the extra mile for them and, and make meals for them or do this or do that? I can't tell you to do it because then it's a waste of time. But when the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, when you realize you have been called for a purpose, when you realize that you are a full-time minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, God wants to use your life this week for his glory. What's happening? What wall are you rebuilding? What wall are you building around your own home? I'm going to have to push on. How does time get away so quickly? <laughs> I can't help but want to do a, do a um, I can't help but want to do a bit of a, a, a demonstration again. So Les, of course, you're always the culprit. <laughs> I need some others. Brennan was advertised, is a volunteer. I can see that now. <laughs> There's no point waiting for volunteers because I haven't got time. <laughs> I'm sure you two love each other, so it's okay. Really? Really? <laughs> you know, I've talked about walls. And you know there's a whole lot of walls that need to be rebuilt. And I'm sure the Holy Spirit can give you all sorts of applications for that. And I talked about rebuilding walls in your own home and storing things, restoring things and sorting things out. There's one wall, and I've deliberately left this to last because I don't want to, I didn't want to influence other things. But one wall, one of the walls I'd like to talk about. In fact, the only wall I've really found in Scripture that is legitimate for us to build in the New Testament. See, in the Old Testament, they fought against flesh and blood. They had to protect themselves from the enemy just coming back and forth. These walls were broken down and the gates were being burned. The enemy was just coming and going whenever they wanted to. In the New Testament, just under the New Covenant, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and powers. So tell me what wall can be built that no principality or power can break through. What wall can I build? What wall can you build that no principality and no power can break through? What wall so often have we not built that has allowed the enemy to come and go and do what he wants whenever he wants? The wall I believe, the only wall that I can see in Scripture that the enemy, the principalities and powers cannot break through is a wall of unity. You see, so often we get challenged... In scripture, because Brennan doesn't really like Les, we get challenged, you know, someone gets up and preaches and talks about forgiveness. So, so Brennan just says, well, really, I do have to love Les. 
I really do have to love Les. Because really it's my biblical responsibility, isn't it? So he's on the altar call and says, God, forgive me for, for speaking about Les like that. And I really need to love him. So they love him. The only problem is that such strong unity like that is easily broken. But there's conviction again, you know, six months later, and, and really there's a passion that really we have to get this thing fixed, and there's this real strong unity now, really strong unity developing with these brethren, because it's biblical and all that sort of stuff. The only problem with this sort of unity is that the enemy can still do his thing. He can come and go and do what he wants. I can just see Les is about to prove me wrong, but anyway. <laughs> I shouldn't choose someone strong like him, because, you know, when you try and break things like this, it... <laughs> You know, no matter how strongly that unity, that beautiful unity is, I guarantee you that if I sat on that unity, that it wouldn't last real long. <laughs> it's artificial. It's artificial. Have I got another volunteer? Good on you, Sam. <laughs> Do you love your dad? <laughs> Just a little. So, so should I put you on the other side? or? <laughs> Just Sam wants a little bit of separation, sorry. He doesn't want to be too close to dad. <laughs> you know what? This separation that, that, that has been there, when there's true conviction in our hearts, when something really, really happens and we realize, God, forgive me. I've allowed insignificant, insignificant things to separate me. I'm preaching it myself this morning. But you know how often in the body of Christ do we allow things to separate us? But when there's a true unity of Christ, I don't know how close you can get, but, you know, when there's something really, really starting to really happen, when we start to build a wall of unity, you know, when the enemy comes and attacks Brennan and knocks the knees out from under him, you're allowed to fall down. Guess what? He's got support. He's got people beside him who love him and care for him. You know, when the enemy is trying to break through and try to divide, there's a strength that prevents it. You know where I'm coming from this morning? Yeah. I'm challenged all over again, brothers and sisters. We have to start to build the walls of unity. We allow the enemy to divide us over such little things sometimes. We allow misunderstandings to come in. And here we are crying out to God, God, move in our midst. God, use my life for your glory. God, pour your blessing upon my house, but I'm not prepared to put things right with my kids. Am I too proud to apologize to my children? The Bible says that where there's unity, God commands a blessing. Yeah. And he's not talking about artificial unity. The devil is not stupid. When the devil sees this sort of unity or just this half-hearted unity, when he sees the heart, this is only an outside demonstration, but when he sees my heart is not joined in genuine unity, the, the enemy is not fooled. And God's not fooled. Brothers and sisters, I believe it's a new day. Not, not because it's the beginning of the year. Please, let's not get on to the New res Year's resolution. My wife made one 20 years ago that she would never make another New Year's resolution. And that's the only one that she's ever kept. No, no, no sorry. No, that's, that's her statement, not mine. I'm over New Year's resolutions, but brothers and sisters, can we resolve today that we need to change? This is a new day. God is doing something. God's been saying some something this morning. And, you know, in the beginning of the service, the things that were happening, God is trying to speak to us, brothers and sisters. Are we ready? Are we ready to move forward? You know, I don't have any more volunteers. Do I have to name names? Can I have some more volunteers? Good on you, Ray. No. <laughs> now, who wants to... Who's going to build a wall here? Okay, come on, do a demonstration. Who wants to build a wall? Can you imagine when we start genuinely, genuinely starting to unite? On you, on you. Woo! Bring it on. Can you imagine what begins to happen? Can you imagine what would happen if we resolve in our heart today? Say, Jesus, I repent. I repent. And I choose. I choose.
as I was about to speak over in Nauru at the beginning of the men's conference, I really just, just in my heart, this whole thought came to me about the, the film Courageous. How many people have seen Courageous? And you know, at the end there, they're, they're, they're crying out to, to, for, for people to make a resolve, to decide and determine in their hearts. No one has to ask me who will set an example for my kids, because I will. And there's this passion building in his heart as he, as he gives this, this, this speech, but asking people to make a resolution in their own hearts before God. No one has to ask me who will, st- who will do this. And it goes on all about fathers, of course. It was an incredible, incredible thing of challenge. But, you know, I was, I was sharing on that. I actually got Janine. I'm in the middle of the service here, and I'm, I just came across, I um, mean, my heart started going over this movie, etc. And here I am in another country, emailing Janine, here, can you find this speech for me, send it over? She emails it back and here I am <laughs> reading it out. But, you know, that was, that was to men and, and that, was, that was just something of God that night. God was doing something. But I want to ask you this morning, we're both men and women here. Can you resolve before God today that no one has to ask you who is going to bridge the gap? Because you will. No one has to ask me who's going to start to mend those, those broken down relationships, that, that misunderstanding, because God, I will. No one has to ask me who's going to reach out to that lost person down my street, because I will. Can you say that to Jesus this morning? Can something rise up in your heart and res- a, a, a resolve in your heart to say, God, no one has to ask. I will no longer ask who is going to reach out to that person, because I will. You don't have to ask me who's going to take a, new, a meal to that, that lady who's just lost her child because I will, God. No one has to ask me who's going to pray for that lost child because, God, I will. Can you resolve in your heart today? Can God just stir something? Can the Holy Spirit stir something in your heart today? That from today on, things will be different for you. I want to ask you this morning as we close, there is a wall here, a demonstration, just a physical wall. But I want to ask you, is there anyone who wants to come and join this wall this morning as a statement to the devil and also a statement to God? To say, God, I will. I will. I will stand, God. I will no longer palm it off. I will no longer say the pastor can do it. I will no longer put the responsibility in someone else's hands because, God, I will. Be careful, I have no one to preach too soon. (laughs) Because, God, I will. I will, God, I will.